Alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa baraka nabiyyana Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa tasliman kathiratun ma ma ba'd. We welcome you back and again at the Bahrain Islamic Center on this 26th night of the month of Ramadan. So we already passed the midpoint of the last 10 nights of Ramadan, Jama'ah. Do you realize that? And that's uh, is one of two things. Whether we start anticipating Eid and just feeling exhausted and let the fatigue take over and then give ourselves excuses not to do better, or it will be the other way around. You realize, oh my God, the marathon is about to end. That's when you put whatever energy that is left in you, you put it right now, inshallah, in these last few nights. May Allah make us among those who will be witness to the Qadr, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And we'll be take the full reward for the last 10 nights of the month of Ramadan. Ameen. Tonight, we have Sheikh Omar, of course, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Him and I will be discussing a topic that I believe each and every one of us, we, uh, uh, we go through on a regular basis. Uh, we've talked about, you know, when the dua is delayed, uh, why is it delayed and so on. So, so that's because obviously most of us, because we're dealing with some hardships. Whether because some of our needs and wants are not being answered, or because of some difficulties we're going through, they're not going away anywhere. And as a result, we feel really frustrated with that. So our topic, inshallah ta'ala, is dealing with hardships. Dealing with hardships. And I'm going to, inshallah, read the chapter from the book of Imam Ibn al-Jawzi, rahimahullah ta'ala, Sayyid al-Khatir, uh, captured thoughts, and then we can comment on it, inshallah, azza wa jal. So Imam Ibn al-Jawzi, he said, قال, من نزلت به بلية فأراد تمحيقها فَلْيَتَصَوَّرْهَا أَكْثَرَ مِمَّا هِيَ تَهُنْ He goes, whoever's been afflicted with a calamity, if you've been tested and tried and afflicted with a calamity, فَأَرَادَ تَمْحِيقَهَا And you really need to get it, get, get it out of your way. You don't want to deal with it anymore. He says, فَلْيَتَصَوَّرْهَا أَكْثَرَ مِمَّا هِيَ Let him imagine, that it, it could have been worse. And if you do so, تَهُنْ Which means, if you, then you'll belittle what you're going through. But if you always magnify what you're going through, bigger than what it is in reality, then it depresses you even more and more. But if you imagine it to be less than what it is really, no matter how big it is, it becomes easy for you to deal with because now you're belittling the impact of this calamity. Keep remembering the reward for enduring it. And let him also anticipate or maybe think of what if it was worse and something bigger came to, to hit me. Qal, if you do so, like thinking of the reward, and it could be, it could be worse, could have been worse, yara ribha fil alayha, you'll find that, alhamdulillah, it's a bargain. It's a, you got a bargain in what you're going through. Because at least it's still, it's still endure, you know, you can endure that. Qal, wal yatalammah sur'ata zawaliha. And think how fast it goes away. Because you've been before in some difficulties and hardships. They didn't last forever. They go away eventually. Mm-hmm. He goes, because if it wasn't for the intensity of the trial, the hope for relief would never come. You know, when things get in, in, very intense, that's when we realize, what is next? What comes after this? There must be relief. That's what Allah promised in the Quran, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're going to elaborate on that. But here, he says, if you didn't see it so hard, you would never think of relief coming very soon. And then he says, قَالْ وَلْيَعْلَمْ أَنَّ مُدَّةَ مُقَامِهَا عِنْدَهُ كَمُدَّةِ مُقَامِ الضَّيْفِ He says, look, keep in mind, think about it, that the, the presence of these trials, the, the length of its stay in your life, is as long as a guest stays in your house, in your hospitality. He says, and how often a guest comes to you, that's number one, and how long do they stay when they come? They don't come very often, unless, mashallah, you're very hospitable. <laughs> and at the same time, when they come, they don't stay forever. Then he says, قَالْ فَلَيَتَفَقَّدْ حَوَائِجَهُ فِي كُلِّ لَحْظَةً Since your guest is just staying here temporarily, and your guest is staying for just a short, a short period of time, what do you do with the guest? You keep checking on the guest. See what the guest is going through, what, he's, what he wants, what their needs are, and how can you make their stay, you know, uh, enjoyable before they leave and so forth. Because the guest doesn't, doesn't stay too long. He leaves right away. 
Yes, the guests stay for a very short period of time, but the praise you get as a result of your hospitality and how you treated that guest and how you dealt with that guest stays eternity. It goes, your praise will be going in all over festivities, all over place, the place. Everywhere you go, people talk about your generosity, mashallah. And you're going to always be described as what? A very generous host. You're a good person. When it comes to difficulties, mashallah, you're such a very good person. You deal with things you know, in, a, in, a, in a good way. Such is the example of the believer. This is the example of the believer during difficulties. You need to pay attention to these moments. These moments in your life, when they happen to you. And you should always check on yourself. How are you going to be dealing with it? If this happened, what am I going to do? If it's happened to me right now, okay, where am I right now? What's my interaction with the situation? Is it positive? Is it negative? And pay attention to your limbs and your senses. Out of fear, that your tongue might utter something that will be kind of like criticizing or something you would regret as a result of the test that you're going through. And be aware of your heart exposing itself and showing tasakhut, which means being displeased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's judgment. He says, and now he's using more of like an abstract example. He goes, look, when the dawn is approaching in the horizon, you realize that the night of calamity is about to leave. Like when the dawn of hope is in the horizon, when you see the light at the end of the tunnel, what does that mean? The darkness of that tunnel is about to go away. Said, The one who travels during the night, he says, the one who takes the, the advantage of the night and travels during the night. Now that back then when they used to travel on the back of the camels, they want to go, they don't want to travel during the sun, during the, the time of uh, the day because it's a desert, right? So they travel at night to pass through the distance without seeing where, they, where they've been. So it makes it shorter for them. Because the same thing, the man or the person, the traveler at night, he will travel throughout the whole night. So by the time the sun comes out, he will see his reward. What is that reward? You've gone through a great deal of distance. You've gone through a great deal of things, alhamdulillah. And you will find yourself very near to your safe home. Very near. So the same thing, those who always take uh, advantage of strengthening their iman and their, their condition, the hal of their heart, before they're hit with these calamities. says, so look, when these things happen, and alhamdulillah, you, you start, you go straight before things intensify, when they're gone, you realize, mashallah, alhamdulillah, I'm in a good hand. So this is what Imam Ibn al-Jawz explains over here. And, and it's interesting thing. There is so much talking about how to deal with hardships. And inshallah, I want to hear from Shaykh Omar his comment on this chapter first. So I want us to um, build every one of these reflections on the previous reflections. So, so far we talked about the idea of the destination top of the mountain or bottom of the stream. And then we talked about the exhaustion of a good deed not lasting, nor the pleasure of sin, right? Because the focus is once again on the destinations. And we talked about the sense of dua, uh, the concept of dua, and this idea of unanswered duas, and how some of the salihin started to enjoy the closeness that they had to Allah and their hardship to a point that they almost didn't want the hardship to go away mm -hmm. because they were enjoying being in that, that proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now when it comes to hardships, I always think about something that Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu said. And Ibn Mas'ud had a hard life. Hard life. Very hard life. Before Islam, after Islam. And he said radiallahu ta'ala anhu that most people enter into Jannah not by a good deed that they do, but by a hardship that they endure. Mm -hmm. Most of the people that enter into Jannah do not enter because of some good that they do, but because of a hardship that they endure. And that matches, of course, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ when he mentions that the majority of the people of paradise are the downtrodden and the oppressed and the wronged 
and those that were generally marginalized in societies. That's the majority of Jannah. When you show up, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those that enter into Al Firdaus al A'la, Allahumma Ameen, make us from as Sabiqun al Awalun. When you show up in Jannah, it's going to be a lot of those people that didn't have any type of stature or status in this life. That's the majority of them, not the privileged. However, at the same time, we're taught not to seek out the poverty, not to seek out the hardship. It's a very interesting concept because just like in du'a, you know, we talked about being multidimensional in du'a, focus on the one that you're calling, not what you're calling him for. The same thing is true. Allah doesn't need to put you to hardship or you don't need the hardship to get the rank. You're not asking Allah for the hardship. You're asking for the rank. Mm -hmm. Just like when you're making du'a, you're not focused on the talab. You're not focused on the ask, the request. You're focused on the one that you're asking from. Likewise, when it comes to hardship, it's not that we seek hardship. We don't seek poverty. We don't seek oppression. We don't seek you know, th these situations. Yet the reality is that the majority of people of paradise would have been people that went through a lot of hardship and they patiently endured. So there's a du'a that comes to my mind. It's one of, one of the most beautiful du'as I ever came across, Sheikh. It's a du'a from Salam ibn Muti'ir, uh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Qala salam, Allahumma in kunta balagta ahadan min ibadika salihin darajatan bi bala fa balagniha bil afia. Allahumma in kunta. بلغت أحد من عبادك الصالحين درجة ببلاء فبلغنيها بالعافية. Can you all repeat it inshallah? اللهم اللهم إن كنت بلغت أحد من عبادك الصالحين درجة ببلاء فبلغنيها بالعافية. Which means, oh Allah, if you caused someone to reach a certain rank through a hardship, through a trial then allow me to reach that rank with afia and safety and being spared. That's the husn of Allah, the good expectation you have of Allah when you ask of Him, right? So your dua should be, Oh Allah, give me the rank and not necessarily the trial. And should Allah choose to test you with the trial, then I'll be patient because my focus is on the rank, not on the hardship or the ease. My focus is still on the rank. So should Allah still respond to that and say, you need this medicine? <laughs> You need this hardship to get you to that rank you're asking? Alhamdulillah. I'm going to be pleased with that as it comes to me. But, oh Allah, give me the rank, the daraja that I am seeking. So here, subhanAllah, in this chapter, it's a, it's a short chapter, but it's a deep, deep, deep chapter. SubhanAllah, I have the long chapter. <laughs> I have to read a lot tomorrow. I was looking at the chapter we're reading tomorrow. It's a short chapter, but it's so deep because look at, how, look at the analogies he uses for hardship. He describes hardship as a guest as a guest. Who thinks of hardship like a guest? A guest that enters upon your house and give the hardship its hukuk, its rights, what? Show karam to the hardship, show, you know, honor the hardship while it's with you because it's a short time. On one hand, he's talking about how many times did a hardship come to you and you thought, I'm never gonna get out of this. How many times did it get so dark that you could not see the light at the end of the tunnel and now you look back on it, and inshallah ta'ala, you have the lessons learned and the reward attained. Mm -hmm. You look back on it and you say, alhamdulillah, I made it. I persevered only by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I thought when I was in the middle of it, this is it. I thought this was my, my breaking point. I thought this was my ta'if. Allah brought me out of it. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. How many times did that happen? And if you, if you did proper, uh, you know, ihtisab, if you did proper account, accounting of yourself, then you would have got the lessons which will benefit you in this life and the reward which will benefit you in the afterlife. But it could be that you were so you know, desperate to just get it over with that maybe you didn't benefit from either. So you said things you, sh you, could, you, sh you shouldn't have said. And the sadmat al-ula, you had a chance at that first strike to say alhamdulillah and boom, a house in paradise and you've got it. But you missed out on an opportunity. So next time a sadmat al-ula comes to you, I learn, okay, last time it hit me, the first strike hit me, I didn't say alhamdulillah. I didn't respond the way I should have. And you learn as-sabr li raja' al-thawab, which is actually the definition the ulama uh, give uh, to the concept of ihtisab. Ihtisab means to seek the reward. Fal-tasbir wal-tahtasib. The Prophet ﷺ said, fal-tasbir, be patient, wal-tahtasib. And seek the reward. Al-ihtisab, uh, the scholars of, of suluk say, as-sabr li raja' al-thawab. It's when you're patient with the hope of a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you're 
taking your patience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and saying, Ya Allah, I'm being patient because I want the reward from you. Mm-hmm. Now the last thing I'll say, and inshallah ta'ala, we can, we can go line by line, Shaykhna. The concept of a guest uh, to a host. Uh, and, and the hardship is, is visiting your house, so give it its right. I remember asking uh, our Shaykh, Shaykh Hatim al-Hajj, hafizahullah ta'ala, about uh, Ayyub alayhi salam. There's an interesting thing that happens with Ayyub alayhi salam where his wife comes to him and she says to him, Ya Nabi Allah, O Prophet of Allah, why don't you just ask Allah to remove the hardship? Why are you bearing this tremendous beatdown? I mean, this is a beatdown. Health, wealth, family. Why are you enduring all of this this way? And why don't you just ask Allah to lift it from you? And uh, he responded, and he said, "Kam How long were we in good times? How long did we have years of ease? How many years of ease did we have?" She said, "80 years." And he said, "And how long have we been in a dara? How long have we been in hardship?" So she said, 18 years. So he said, once I reach 80 years of hardship, I'll ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to lift it from me. And one of the things that, that our Shaykh said, Hafidullah ta'ala, he said that Ayyub alayhi salam arad an yuhaqqiq al manzil. He wanted to properly benefit from the moment that he was in. He knew that Allah Azza wa was sending him a time and he wanted to give that hardship its right. So he wanted to, to honor the hardship in a way that you know, look, Allah's putting me through something right now. Let me make sure I'm doing things right. Like, I'm not really in a rush to get it over with, but I am eager to do it right. I'm not in a rush to get it over with. I'm eager to do it right. Not that it doesn't hurt. Not that it's, you, you should ask Allah for hardship. But when the guest is with you, honor the guest. Don't be so quick to try to kick it out. You know, the guest showed up for a reason. Let me try to do what I can so that I can get the greatest reward out of it. You know, Sheikh, subhanAllah, interesting that you, you, you emphasize on how he uh, tried to use, of course, the abstract concept of using or treating that calamity as a guest. There's also another uh, message there, is that whenever uh, um, you receive a guest, at least back in those days when hospitality was an honor in the society, and you have to understand the context of this, why he speak about hospitality to be a big deal. Because alhamdulillah, hospitality for us today is no big deal. If anyone comes in unannounced, you just simply just order pizza and we're done. Khalas, yani. But back then, most of these guests are unannounced anyway because they come from the desert. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, people, in order for them to honor these guests, what they do, they anticipate the presence of guests by lighting fires outside of their houses, calling these guests to come over. So imagine if someone is calling into the calamities to come over, right? It sounds like someone who wants to, what? Wants to, to prove to God, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my Lord, I'm worthy of your ni'am, your blessings, try me. But that's not what he's asking for. He's not what he's saying, actually. He's just saying that the fact that whenever you have a guest, you put every possible resource that you have to, to deal with that guest in the best way possible so that the outcome of that hospitality is something that will be honoring for you in the dunya and the akhirah. That's what it means. So dealing with the guests, of course, providing food, shelter, this, that, you know, companionship, chit chat them, talking to them, and so on. Dealing with calamities, of course, dealing with it, with, with how are you supposed to be dealing with it? We're going to come to it, inshallah. There are four stages on how to deal with a calamity, actually. But prior to this point, you remind me of what you mentioned about how uh, enduring the hardship is in itself, of course. <clears throat> Pursuing the hardship itself is not a goal. Right. We are not supposed to pursue the hardship. However, if it comes your way, then your obligation is to endure it. Soliciting it in itself, no. As the Prophet keeps asking us to do it, is Allah al-Afiyah. Always ask Allah for safety. Alhamdulillah, for good health and wealth and so on. Ask Allah for these good things. But don't risk it. Don't try to try Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Although in Sunan Tirmidhi, the Prophet says in the hadith, Inna idham al jazai min idham al bala. That the magnitude of your reward is in correlation to the magnitude of your, punish, of, of your, of your tri, and trial and, and calamity. Which means, you get reward as much as hardships you go through. Which was also mentioned clearly in another hadith, Hadith Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, when she was complaining about the hardships she was going through during Hajj. During Hajj. She was kind of complaining, it was hard, it's this and that. The Prophet was reminding her, he goes, Ya Aisha, listen. He says, Ya Aisha, listen to me. Ajruki ala qadrin asabuki. Your reward 
is equivalent in proportion, basically, it's equivalent to the hardships you have to endure and go through. But, once again, it does not mean that you should be pursuing these hardships. Continuation of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, when he talked about the magnitude of the reward, or the size of the reward is equivalent to the size of the, 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 the trial you go through, he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, قال, وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ إِذَا حَبَّ قَوْمٍ ابْتَلَاهُمْ And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the people, He will put them to a trial, to a test. Because you can't just claim that you're, you're a servant of God and then not be trusted. Which was made extremely clear in the Quran, in Surah, in Surah Al-Ankabut, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alif Lam Mim. حَسِبَ النَّاسُ وَيُتْرَكُوا يَقُولُوا أَمَنَّ وَهُمْ لَا يَفْتَنُونَ What? People think that they're going to be left to say, we believe and not going to be tested? Which is so ironic today, when people are tested, what do they say? Why me? Mm -hmm. And I always tell people, this is not the right question you should ask. The question is, why not? Because Allah didn't make it a secret. He said, I'm going to be testing each and every one of you. When? It's on His terms, not your terms. So therefore, when the trial comes, that's what Ibn al is trying to say. Treat it as a guest. It's not going to last forever. You've been told you have a guest coming over. Already in the Quran, multiple times. You've been told that this guest is not going to be an easy guest. It's going to be one of those nasty guests. So therefore, you need to endure that and, and deal with it in the best way possible. So the Prophet ﷺ continues the hadith, he says, in regards to how to deal with these hardships, he goes, فَمَنْ رَضِيَ فَلَهُ الرِّضَى وَمَنْ, وَمَنْ صَخِطَ فَلَهُ الصَّخْطِ If you express rida, which means contentment and satisfaction, you shall receive satisfaction from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a reward for you, for your satisfaction, for his qadr. وَمَنْ صَخِطَ فَلَهُ الصَّخْطِ You want to show the, being displeased with Allah's qadr? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show you the same. He's not going to be pleased with your action or reaction to it. Which means, choose for yourself. You know Allah subhanahu is going to give you reward based on what you express. If you express contentment and acceptance and so forth, then Allah will give you that as well as a reward. And if Allah is pleased with you and accepting you, subhanAllah, what do you accept from the most general subhanahu wa ta'ala? Similarly, if you're going to be saying, no, that's not what I, uh, I signed up for, then uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, okay, fine, you're on your own. So be careful with that. So that's one thing. The, so now that we know that the reward is so huge because my calamity, my trial is so huge as well too, then why not then uh, um, even ask for it? The answer is no. The Prophet sallam, he was asking us to seek safety. That's number one. Number two, there's hadith in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa dua that we've been repeating after Salat al-Asr every single day here. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min darak al-shaqa wa Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min jahd al-bala wa darak al-shaqa wa su'u al-qada wa shamarat al-a'da. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who is telling us the reward for enduring hardship is this great, he's still asking us to say these words. Ya Allah, I ask you to protect me min jahd al-bala. From the, from the fatigue that is caused by the trial. Like, I don't want to be fatigued when I go through the hardships, my Lord. And that misery catches up with me as a result of that. And that, Ya Allah, I seek refuge in you from a qada that brings me hardships and evil. And then, Shamarat al Ada, and Ya Allah, protect me from my enemies to, uh, uh, to find joy and happiness in my misery. So you look at these, this dua is so profound as well too. Even though the Prophet is telling us, look, enduring hardship is going to get you a great reward, but he's telling us, don't ask for it. But if it happens, that's when you need to read it as a guest and endure. No. I, th I think, subhanAllah, and a lot of times people ask, well, what's the methodology here? Is there a methodology? And sometimes the methodology is right in front of you. You're just, it's applying it, right? The application of it. And so he mentions these things and they're very important. So just like when we talked about looking at the past to get to the future, the first thing we said, which he mentions, is look to your past hardships. You got out when you thought you weren't going to get out. You made it through. You learned some lessons and inshallah ta'ala, you got the reward. That's mm -hmm. number one. You made it through when you thought you weren't going to make it through. That was Allah's blessing upon you. Lola fadlullahi alaykum, had it not been for the blessing of Allah upon you, you would have never made it through. Right? You would have cracked. You didn't crack, alhamdulillah. You made it through. Could have been a more perfect answer, but you'll perfect it next time, inshallah ta'ala. So the first thing is look at your previous hardships. The second thing is look to those who have greater hardships than you. The story of resilience 
is one that often needs role models. I mean in anything, right? Someone that's hit some hard, you know, some, some hard obstacles in their business and their career, and they start reading about how people in their trade got through, got through sim a similar tragedy, made it through, and that inspires them and sometimes also gives them some of the science behind overcoming that obstacle, right? Your workout obstacles, your, uh, your, your, your life goals. You know, looking at someone that passed the test, resilience is a trait. It's actually something that is deeply human and deeply beautiful. It's actually what we're going to be talking about tomorrow. So tomorrow's topic, by the way, is why humans can be better than angels. And this is one of his longest chapters, ironically, subhanAllah. But it's so human and so beautiful, so profound. You watch the stories of these people that could have given up in life, right? And, you know, someone, for example, who's uh, has, has no arms, no legs, but somehow finds happiness and joy and resilience in life and see, finds ways to achieve everything that they can in life and has a big smile on their face and has such a rida. That sometimes that pleasure is not even just, uh, or that, that pleasure is not even for any type of reward in the hereafter. It's just the joy of being able to overcome because there's joy in that. That's one of the mm -hmm. rewards of the good deed in this life that as Ata rahimahullah said, when you look back and you look at something that you conquered, you feel good about yourself. Alhamdulillah, I got through it. So that's a person sometimes that doesn't even have anything that they're looking forward to in the hereafter. And they feel good. They feel a sense of, of accomplishment. And that's a human yield. That's something that's also a gift of God, that you have that yield of accomplishment. Alhamdulillah, I overcame. But then the, the, the main one that he says, وَلْيَتَوَهَّمْ نُزُولَ أَعْظَمَ مِنْهَا يَرَى الرِّبْحَ فِي الْاِقْتِصَارِ to actually sit there and to try to immerse yourself in the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if I get this right. The believer has to have this tasawwur. They have to have this ability to sit and to contemplate and to, and to actually imagine the reward. They have yaqeen, certainty in the reward, certainty in the hereafter, certainty in the jazat. Like, Ya Allah, Jannah? Wow. You know, like, if I get this right, these, these few moments, right? Jannah? Baytun Yusamma Bayt al Hamd? A home called the House of Praise for me? These rewards? All of this for me? The companionship of the Prophet ﷺ? Eternity? La tasma'u fiha laghiyah? You're not going to hear any type of, of, of bothersome noise, nothing that's going to distract you, nothing that's going to bother you. So you actually sit there and you think about that jaza. You think about that reward. And you put yourself in that position and you say, this is so worth it. This is so worth it to go through these few years that I probably won't even remember. And on the day of judgment, subhanAllah, and this is also, uh, you know, when it comes to the past, when you look at the past, how many times do you look at, at a past hardship? When you were in the midst of it, it felt like an eternity. But now you look back on it and it feels like it passed pretty quickly. You know, but when you were in it, it felt like it was never ending, right? And then what happens on the Day of Judgment? The life of this world, for the person who lived an easy life or for the person who lived a hard life, both, those, both of those people are going to be saying, لَبِثْنَا يَوْمًا أَبَعْضَ يَوْمًا Felt like we only live for a day or part of a day. Like you're standing on the Day of Judgment, just the, the standing of Yawm Al-Qiyamah, and you'd be like, it felt like it was just a day or less than a day even. Whether you lived the most beautiful of life, lives or you live the most difficult of lives, that's what you're going to come to in terms of a conclusion. So you have that amal, that hope, that, that, that ability to see the goal. And sit there and to really desire it and to exert your energy towards it and say, Ya Allah, I'm in the midst of this. Ya Rabb, grant me Jannah. Ya Rabb, grant me Al-Firdaus. Ya Rabb, someone is, is, is slandering me, someone's hurting me. Ya Rabb, grant me the honor of the Akhirah. Ya Rabb, mm -hmm. I lost something of this life. Ya Rabb, grant me the reward of Al-Jannah. Grant me the treasures of Al-Jannah. Ya Rabb, I've lost some companions, some people that I, I miss. Ya Rabb, grant me the companionship of the Prophet ﷺ. You know, take that pain that you're feeling and to channel it into a dua and say, Ya Allah, grant me something in, in, in the hereafter. I, I have to end with this, Shaykh, subhanAllah, in this regard. I know it's a long tangent and I apologize, Shaykhna. Asya always blows my mind, Ali has salam. The one word that, or, or the few words we have from her in the Quran, it was mentioned yesterday. My Lord, grant me with you a house in paradise. 
And what the ulama say, this is the perfect form of ihtisab. Like if you want an example of sabr, you look at Maryam alayhi salam, patience, right? If you want an example of ihtisab, and of course Maryam did ihtisab as well, she, she sought the reward of Allah, but like the perfect words of ihtisab are actually found in the words of Asiya. This is, if you want a methodology, if you want to summarize ihtisab, seeking the reward in patience, it's Asiya. Why? Asiya is the wife of the Pharaoh for people to know that. <laughs> Asiya, the wife of Pharaoh. So Asiya said, Rabb ibn li indak. Oh Allah, build for me with you. With you, i.e. in place of Fir'aun. Replace the company of Fir'aun with the company of God. I have endured the company of this tyrant. Grant me your company instead. <laughs> Before she asked for the house, she asked for that. Ya Allah, I lived with Fir'aun, now I want to live with you. Indak, <laughs> baytan fil jannah. I lived in the palace of the Pharaoh. I want the palace of paradise. So in this one sentence, in her dua, she expressed ihtisab in the most beautiful of ways. Replace all of this with these two things and I'm good. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give her? Allah azza wa jal showed her. Showed her her place in paradise. While she was being killed. Mm -hmm. So what did she do? You know, Fir'aun's torture, his torture tactics were the sickest tactics of them all. He was a sick man. Demented man. Tyrants tend to get very sick and evil and they lose all sense of humanity and they would even torture their own family members. You see this, you know, I remember subhanAllah, the, 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 they said the, the North Korea had uh, he, Kim, he threw his uncle to a pack of wild dogs and watched them eat him, devour him because he accused him of treason. Like he, he made his wife, the wife of his uncle, sit there and watch the dogs devour him, a wild pack of dogs. Tyrants can get really weird and demented and sick. Fir'aun, your wife, your wife. And you're going to have all of these strange people, you know, humiliate her, beat her, whip her, and then drop a boulder from the top of a cliff to shred her to pieces? Where's your decency? Where's your humanity? Where's your manhood? Where's your anything, right? N no conscience? But subhanAllah, she saw Jannah. فضحكت. She laughed. And they thought she was a crazy woman. They're whipping her, they're torturing her, which shows you that if you really can see the jaza, the bala does not matter. If you can see the reward, the hardship becomes literally so insignificant that in the midst of her beating and her torture, she laughed and she was staring at Jannah. And they're whipping her and beating her and she's laughing. And when the boulder comes and falls on her, Allah takes her soul and the Prophet ﷺ said that the believer's soul exits from you know, the believer's soul exits from the mouth and they see their soul leaving with their eyes. So the believer, the soul comes out and the eyes watch. It, it watches the soul leave. And subhanAllah, the boulder falls down on her and crushes her body to pieces. But Allah Azza wa Jalla spared her. And the Prophet ﷺ said that Shaheed, the martyr, sees their place in Jannah with the first strike. The first strike, they already see their place in Jannah. So subhanAllah, this is the, the beautiful example of ihtisab that sort of brings together dua and I think mm -hmm. hardship of these two chapters. Zakallah Khashib, I want to focus on um, what you mentioned earlier. It's all about actually that moment of ihtisab when you hope for the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you endure that moment when the trial comes, which is exactly the meaning of hadith in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, innama sabru inda sadmat al-ula, that patience, is recorded, which means your reward for being patient is recorded at the first strike. You know, some people, they, they go through some difficulties and what do they do? They complain to everybody, starting an online, of course. You know, put all their rants online, and then after some time, what do they go? They go, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? You left no one in the neighborhood, but they knew about your situation and the whole uh, world and the internet, you know, what you've been going through and all the stuff and so on. And after you just kind of like vented and just get everything out, then you realize there's nothing I can do about it. So what do you, do? What do you say? Alhamdulillah. Allah, may Allah reward me for it. Well, may Allah reward you for it. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. But you lost the greatest reward in the first strike. Why? Because that moment of endurance is extremely, extremely important. Which is what Imam Ibn Jawzi, rahimahullah, he says here. فَكَذَلِكَ الْمُؤْمِنْ Such the, the affair of the believer. He says, فِي الشِدَّةِ يَنْبَغَنْ يُرَاعِ السَّعَاتِ During times of hardship and difficulty, you need to watch for these moments. He goes, watch for these moments. Because he says, look, they're going to happen. Those moments, they're not secrets. Allah try, said that He's going to test you. He's been saying it in the Quran over and over again, over and over again. You are going to be going through some difficulties. He says, subhanAllah, He's going to test you with what? 
or diminishing of wealth and health and, and, and family and, and, and fear and all these kind of things. وَبَشِّرُ الصَّابِرِينَ Give the good news for those who persevere in patience. الَّذِينَ إِذَا صَابَتُهُ مُصِيبَةً Those who want to be afflicted with a calamity, what do they say? إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ That's all the, Those are the people who would always go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek His pleasure. So we need to make sure to stay firm at the time of the calamity. Now, how can do this? We talk about this later. Ibn Qayyim has a, 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 an interesting actually caught on this matter. But prior to this, his Shaykh Ibn, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he says the position and the stance of the believer when it comes to the subject of calamity, he says the believers, the, oh not the believers, people in general, he said, people in general, they go through one of four uh, stages, or you could say an ahwal, kind of like, uh, more of like an affair of the heart. You go through one of those four and choose for yourself where do you want to be. When someone is afflicted with a calamity, when someone is tested with a trial, the first, the first category, those who express what? A sukht. What does sukht mean over here? Displeasure. Like I'm not happy with it. And they don't just feel it in their heart. No, they express it. They complain. Why me? Why this? Why that? They just keep complaining about not just the calamity itself. They go even way and beyond. A'udhu Billah start complaining about Allah Himself subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have seen and heard people speak like this. They speak to Allah as if He is an equal to them. It's like, me? Why me? I go, why not? Well, I'm the good girl. I'm the good guy. I'm this and that. It doesn't matter. So some people, in a moment of calamity, they break down. So that very important moment where they're supposed to endure the impact of that hardship that gives them the ultimate reward for it is gone. Because they lost that moment. The second category... He said, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Maqam al Sabr, the station and the condition of patience. What does patience mean over here? Patience in itself, it just means that you, um, you don't have to accept it in your heart. Instead, you only hold yourself from reacting negatively to it. So you don't complain, you don't whine about it, and if you do, you don't whine about Allah Azza wa Jal. You don't whine about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You just whine about your affairs. It's so hard. I don't know. But still, you're not saying anything bad about Allah Azza wa Jal. And you're not doing anything bad about it. You simply just hold yourself patiently to this. So they say as sabr is when you kind of withhold yourself from reacting negatively. But you still, in your heart, you're displeased with it. You're not happy about it. And you're trying everything in your power to remove that pain that is caused by this calamity. Right. So that's called patience. And there's nothing wrong with that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا بِغَيْرِ حساب. Those who persevere in patience shall get the reward from Allah Azza wa Jal without measure. So that's a virtue. But is that the best virtue? The answer is no. There's something better than that. What is that? قَالْ مَقَامُ الْرِضَى The condition and the station of a rida And what does a rida mean over here? It means pleasure and satisfaction, contentment. Like I'm content right now. Because Allah Azza wa tests me. I don't know why, but I trust His judgment. I don't know why, but I trust His judgment, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's called rida. Like sometimes I wonder why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put me through this. I'm not questioning His judgment and His wisdom. I'm just wondering to myself, what can I do about it? So I am patient. I'm not yelling or wailing or screaming or or cursing or cussing. No, none of that stuff. No, 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 no. I'm very patient with that. And I also, I'm not in a rush to remove that pain. Why? Because I know Allah has hikmah and wisdom for me to go through this. So I am going to trust His judgment and, and ask Allah to guide me to go through it easily. So I'm trying as to somehow, but accept Allah's judgment for me. And that's the example that the Prophet of Allah subhanahu mentioned in Surah Al-Kahf about the parents who lost their child in the story of Al-Khidr and Musa alayhi salam. When, when Al-Khidr, he, uh, he ended the life of that child, of these parents. Now these parents, they, will, they would n probably never know who killed their child, never find justice for their child at all, and they were going to go through the pain of wondering what happened to my child and who did that to them throughout their life. But what made them move forward with their life? His parents were believers. So they trust Allah's judgment. 
and they knew there's a hikmah and wisdom behind it, which they didn't know at the time. But Allah was hiding something better for them, which is a child that is going to be better than this one. So that's maqam ur rida right? So we have a sukht being displeased with it, then being patient, and now being pleased and content. Okay, is there anything better than this? What do you guys think? Is there any station even better than that? What do you think? What would, the, what would that be? Anticipation of the reward? He said, maqam al-shukr. Being grateful. What does that mean? Knowing there is ni'mah in there. You're going through hardships, and you're just like, alhamdulillah. Allah, Allah knows about me. Allah's testing me. You know it's a test, and it's hard. But you know what? You're not just patient. You're not just accepting and content about it and with it. No. You're seeing things other people don't see. A blessing in disguise. I don't know what it is, but I know. Alhamdulillah, my Lord, alhamdulillah, Rabbi Amin. And these are the examples, Sheikh, that you said. Some people will be somehow going through some hardship, like they don't even, they lost their sight, or maybe they lost a limp or so in an accident and so on. And when you come and talk to them, they say, alhamdulillah, I'm still alive. Like, are you kidding me? I mean, you just lost an arm. Alhamdulillah, what's an arm? I'm still alive. I can still make dhikr. I can still worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What an unbelievable state of mind and heart to be going through such a hardship, but you still only see what? A ni'mah and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is maqam al-shukr that everybody, not anyone can get there unless they're, of course, in a true level of iman and belief, which is hadith al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, azab al-amr al-mu'min. Strange is the affair of the believer. إِنَّ أَمْرَهُ كُلَّهُ لَهُ خَيْرٌ Everything the believer goes through is good. إِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ سَرَّاءٌ If being blessed with, with prosperity and goodness, they will show gratitude and that's good for the believer. وَنَ أَصَابَتْهُ دَرَّاءٌ صَبَرٌ And if they go through a calamity, they show and express patience and that's also good for the believer. And no one can handle this except a true believer. Finally, Shaykh, I want to mention something about from Ibn, Ibn Taymiyyah رحمه الله تعالى in regard to this matter. He goes, look, you guys have to understand, we talked about uh, enduring at the moment of the calamity itself, like the impact moment. That's when everything counts the most. Remember that, Rajma. When you hear the news, when someone gives you a call, says, this has happened. When you see something that affects you immediately, when you realize you got laid off or fired or this or that, it's, suddenly you feel the whole world is collapsing, right? Some people, they go, may Allah make it easy for them through, through divorce, for example, or this or whatever. A lot of hardships. We go through a lot of hardships, subhanAllah. At the impact, the moment of impact of that, this is where it matters the most. So Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, he says, look, عند المصيبة يذهل الإنسان عن العلم At the moment of calamity, the moment of the calamity, the insan becomes extremely heedless of the knowledge. Like what you know becomes useless. Mm-hmm. Which is actually, subhanAllah, coincides with the theory of human psychology today, is that when you're in, a, in, a, in an extreme emotional state, your rational state goes down. It yields to the emotional state. When you're too emotional, your rational goes down because had you yield, had to yield to this. So that's why don't make any judgment until you, re, you recalibrate and you balance them both again. That's when it's best for you to make a judgment. But here he says, when you're in a moment of, of calamity right now, you don't even remember your name, let alone, you know, what you learned from the shaykh and teacher and this and that and so on. So the knowledge actually goes out of the window. He says, what helps people in this moment? Qal al-iman. The strength of your iman will be the thing that will hold you together. That's why, in my personal experience in life, subhanAllah, and I'm a human being as well, like everybody else, we've seen some student of knowledge in a moment of calamity, they fall apart. Students of knowledge. To them, like, you say these things? You do these things? But because they're too emotional in that moment of calamity, the rationale drops down because their iman probably was not in the position where they can endure their hardship. And what helps you strengthen your iman, and that's here the core moment for everybody to learn, is the practice. The more you practice of what you know, the higher your iman goes. And the less you practice of what you know, it goes down. So it's extremely important what you guys gained in this month of Ramadan. Don't let it go to waste. Really, do not let that moment of Iman rush that you gain in Ramadan go to waste. You make sure that you get the best out of it, inshallah ta'ala. Zakumal khair, Shaykhna. A few things that came to my mind with what you just said, and inshallah we can, we can then take it to the questions. 
um, at the moment. SubhanAllah, again, the story of resilience. So you mm -hmm. have in the moment, I mean, I know people, again, when a car accident happens and they're asking, what's your phone number? And the phone number of someone close to you can't even recall like a phone True. number, can't recall like a basic name. Where do you live? What's your address? And you're in such a heightened state that you don't know. And in the grave, yep. when the angels come, man rabbuk, huh? Huh? That's what the Prophet said. A person will be saying, huh? Huh? I don't know. What? This is a Muslim, a person who grew up on la ilaha illallah. Right? But they didn't used to pray. They didn't used to hold on to their salah. They didn't used to practice their faith. And so, at that moment, when these angels show up and they shake you, huh? Man rabbuk? Ma dinuk? Allahumma thabbitna ya Rabbi. Ameen. What's your religion? Huh? What's your religion? Who's your prophet? Huh? No, the Prophet ﷺ literally made the noise, by the way. Huh? Huh? That's what people are going to be saying in, in the grave. May That's Allah why it's called the, the, the greatest fitna. It is. The greatest fitna. Greatest test. May Allah give us thabat. May Allah Amin Allah. give us firmness. Amin. Allahumma thabitna in this salat. Amin. Oh Allah grant each and every single one of us steadfastness for Amin that moment. Allah. Allahumma ameen. That's Amin. why it's so hard to pass that test. Because this is not something that you can, you know, you know, when the burying sometimes you call out and you say, you know, there's, there's a fabricated hadith that the Prophet ﷺ did this with his son, with Ibrahim. Mm -hmm. It's a fabrication, it's moldor. And, and it's deeply problematic because it's an assumption. Like call out to them and say, <laughs> when the two angels come to you and they ask you, man rabbuk say Allah. And when they ask you, that's not going to benefit that person. Because you know what? When those angels show up, all oh, this is, <laughs> this is another world now, right? That's not going to benefit you. You have to have solidified that in a deep, deep, deep place in your heart. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, I know it's hard for us sometimes to come to these moments, but it makes me love the Prophet sallallahu so much more when I, when I read about how he struggled with his kids. Mm. Like, honestly, it's some of the most endearing moments of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some of the things that make you love him most is when he's in pain. Because our natural instinct, the empathy, is you want to comfort someone, especially someone you love, and like, Ya Rasulullah, I want to hug you when I, when I hear about you crying about Ibrahim and Zainab and the Sahaba. Well, and to Ya Rasulullah, wait a minute, you too, Ya Rasulullah? Because when Ibrahim was in his, in, his, in his hands, I mean, he wasn't just kind of crying. It wasn't like an awkward moment of silence where a few tears were falling. The Prophet Sallallahu beard was soaked. The tears were falling on the corpse of his dead child. Think about the scene. I mean, that's an intense, it doesn't get more intense than that when you can see the tears of a father falling on his baby boy in his hands. Ya Rasulullah, ma hadha? Are you falling apart? Not you, wa anta ya Rasulullah, you too, ya Rasulullah. But the Prophet ﷺ was able to give the most perfect answer. Like had the Prophet ﷺ said on the manbar, inna al-ayna la tadma, verily the eyes shed tears, the heart feels pain, and we are sad when we lose something. But we only say that which is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Had the Prophet said that on a manbar in a completely calm tone, that's a great methodology. What a rule of patience, right? That's profound wisdom. The fact he was able to recall that and say that while he was crying, holding his, his dead son, it makes it even more profound. That means he's, he's pulling this out some, from somewhere, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that cannot be contained in immediate rationale. And I wit subhanAllah, Shaykh, I witnessed this in my own lifetime. And I won't elaborate because I'll probably fall apart, but my own mother, Allah when she came out of a coma, could recite verses of the Qur'an before she knew the names of her children. <laughs> that's, that's, that's karama, that's like miracles. And I've heard of other people that have been through that, like can remember coming out of a coma, ayat of the Qur'an, before they could remember the, the names of their children. I saw that, I witnessed that. That's not rational. That's Allah, and, and that's when I think about like Allah Azawajal gifts some people with guidance, with hidayah and thabat. Like that's why we ask him at the end of the day. You know, if, 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 if we're students of knowledge and, and you know, uh, sometimes I feel, you know, like there's an imposter syndrome here because we know teachers that are way, 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 way. I know teachers that are way ahead of me. I know Sheikh Yasser is way more knowledgeable than me and I'm not just saying that in his face. Anymore. Sure about like, that? I'm positive, I think so. <laughs> but like, at the end of the day, what are we all doing? You're asking Allah for guidance. The person that, that, that doesn't have ijazat and doesn't know how to even read these texts, 
but they have a deep connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they're asking Allah for hidayah day and night. They're asking Allah to, to solidify that, to plant that in a very deep place in their hearts and in their, in their minds. And it may be that Allah gifts you with that. And Allah does not give someone that knows the texts about hidayah much, much more than you. Uh, you know, this idea of, of someone knowing, that's an ilm. ليس العلم بكثرة الرواية as Imam Malik rahimahullah said knowledge is not the ability to quote narrations العلم نور it's a نور that Allah يجعل الله في قلب المؤمن that Allah puts in the heart of the believer العلم knowledge is a light that Allah puts in the heart of the believer and that light grows when you're able to withstand these moments of darkness mm. and recommit yourself every time to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that's you know, I just add, if I one more to just mention, Shaykh, this is very important, subhanAllah, I think, I, get, I think it's important for us to understand here. I want to elaborate on it once again. When it comes to the subject of knowledge, it's not really about how much you read and how much you attend in terms of sessions and videos and this. And that's not really, it doesn't show knowledge. That just shows what we call in the Arabic ma'rifa, which means you have the information. That's all. Just like when you go to college, and by the end of you're done with your four years, six years, ten years, whatever many years that you go to school, they give you a certificate. You've only been certified, not educated. <laughs> education is a different, different thing. It's a whole different game when it comes to education. Similar when it comes to the subject of Iman versus knowledge. You attend all these halaqat, and all what you get is the information. How much of that information you're going to translate into making it knowledge, that's up to you. And that's why sometimes Bedouin, really, who doesn't, doesn't even know how to read and write, could, ha- could be Waliullah Azza wa could be the Wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you that's spending days and nights and years in studying knowledge and ilm and books and so on, you're not even close. Why? Because that Bedouin, he learned something simple, and it became so profound to him to make a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, made his iman so strong, he can endure hardship better than you, the student of knowledge. And that's the example of the man, the Bedouin, when he was asked, how did you know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He goes, what are you talking about? I saw the droppings of the camel. I realized the camel must have passed through this place. And I saw footsteps. I realized a human being must have walked through this. And now you're telling me that all these amazing, magnificent domes of the sky and, and the paths in this earth, shouldn't there be enough evidence that there is a Hakim and Khabir, knowledgeable, all wise, who creates something like this, subhanahu wa ta'ala? What an unbelievable you know, knowledge coming from an ayah or two. And his ma- this man, he's relating his knowledge to what? to droppings of a camel and footsteps in the desert. That's knowledge of Imam. That's a profound knowledge. But us today, no, it has to be sophisticated. If I took it, if I took it from a book and put so many titles to it and make fancy, you know, uh, sub, uh, sub, uh, subject and this and that, and so, if it's not philosophical enough for me, it doesn't sound like knowledge. No, that's called information, okay? How much of that translates into your personal life to make you so soft in the heart that's the profound knowledge, and that's what Iman actually is going to be all about. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you all that profound knowledge, Ya Rabbil Alameen, that you'll find its effect in your heart, Ya Allah, and in your life. Bismillah. Let's take a question, Can I, inshallah ta'ala. Can I just 30 seconds, just 30 seconds, the end of it, because I don't want to lose the, the analogy. فَمَا طَلَعَتْ شَمْسُ الْجَزَاءِ إِلَّا وَقَدْ وَصَلَ إِلَى مَنْزِلِ السلامة, uh, To treat your ease, the, the reward, as the sunrise to your darkness, which is the night, your hardship, which is the darkness of the night. And of course, what he means here is the certainty of the jaza, the reward coming to you is as certain as you are when you go to sleep that the sun will rise. Not that you'll have to find a light somewhere. The sun will rise. And so the jaza, to think of your hardship as a moment of sleep, darkness of the night, understanding that the jaza, the reward is that sunrise in the morning. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to see it. I'm going to have to add another 30 seconds, yeah, Chef. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they don't mind. Man. There's a lot, there's so much we can go back I and know. forth in this matter. But what you just said here, remind me with Qawlullahi wa ta'ala. وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا عَسْعَسَ وَالصُّبْحِ إِذَا تَنَفَّسَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاللَّيْلِ I swear to you by the night when it comes to the darkest, darkest moment, then you will see the breakthrough of the fajr, which means when the day breaks. So what is that? The ulama, they say, look, you cannot see, you're not going to see the, 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 the morning light unless it gets too dark first. That's one. Number two. Allah described the break of dawn as what? He says, tanafas, which means what? Start breathing. Start breathing. What does that mean? It's like being suffocating. Like the night was suffocating you. This trial was suffocating you. And then, subhanAllah, suddenly start breathing, giving you life back. So, rest assured, if you trust Allah subhanAllah's judgment and you elevate yourself instead of going through sukht 
and being discontent, to being patient, to have rida, and then all the time see the blessings of Allah and everything around you, even in calamities, when you get to that maqam of shukr, you're there. But you're not going to get there unless you have that profound knowledge. Not just information. How much of I know I'm practicing that affects my heart and eventually translates into my personal life. Wallahu a'lam. You got Any more 30, 30 seconds, Shaykh? That was a beautiful 30 seconds. I what about yours? Another 30 seconds? No, khalas, khalas. Okay. <laughs> so, let's take questions for the brothers, inshallah ta'ala. Okay. You want to take this? Where's the, where's the microphone? Oh, good. Somebody from here, inshallah ta'ala. Behind you, behind you. Umar, Umar, behind you. Okay, call us, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi When going through a hardship, one of the questions that I had was, um, when it comes to confiding in other people, as opposed to, you know, confiding uh, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does a healthy balance of that look like in order to make sure that you're not, you know, relying in the wrong place? I got you. So the question is simply, if I rephrase the question, uh, what differentiates between me complaining to Allah and complaining about Allah Azza wa Jalla, right? Like when you go to talk to people about what you're going through, am I, being, uh, uh, am I whining about it right now? Am I really not being patient enough or not showing gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the example of the story of Yusuf alayhi salam when uh, Ya'qub, his father, what did he say? Qala innama ashku bathi wa huzni ila Allah. I only disclose my grief and my sorrow to my Lord. So he, he was complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not about Allah Azza wa Jal. If people complain to others, you go to a counselor, you go to a friend, you go to a family member, and you try to give them what you're going through, and you tell them the pain that you're going through. If that kind of com complaining, or at least addressing the issue, focuses on why me and how Allah is doing this to me and this and that, then you're in trouble. But if it's just about, you know, so this is so hard for me, what can I do about it, how can I do this, how can I do that? Alhamdulillah, you're still in good, in good position. But are you at the level of rida, which is better than patience? No. Which is bring me to the, to, to actually the, the ulama, they argue, say, what is the obligation of a believer? There is no doubt, a sukht is haram. Showing displeasure of Allah's judgment is not acceptable. That's, that's prohibited. So if you do it, that's actually a sin in itself. The second thing, patience, they say, it's an absolute obligation. An obligation to be patient. But showing satisfaction, they say, is highly recommended. So if you don't show the satisfaction, you're not going to, don't escape the being, being patient. Wallahu ta'ala. Now, nah. sisters, any question on this side? Should I, should I read this uh, question? Go ahead. So a question that came, what does it mean if you're patient at the first strike, but start to lose patience and iman as time passes? It's actually a really uh, important question because some people do better in the beginning mm. and deteriorate, and some people do horrible in the beginning and then settle. We, we have different means of grief in different ways, subhanAllah, that we react to these types of things. Um, so just a methodology, and I gave a khutbah about this recently, measuring patience by progress. The short-term measure of patience and the sadmat al-ula at the first strike is whether you said alhamdulillah and inna lillahi wa ilayhi raji'un and you, you held yourself. The long-term is did you progress in your journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Did you increase in obedience and decrease in disobedience to mm -hmm. Allah That's how you measure patience in the long-term. Because that means you learned the lessons from the patience, from the, from the hardship. And so you grew in your relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the grieving part of this, because we're such complex beings and we get tested in different ways, uh, it, doesn't mean, it doesn't mean you're not patient if it starts to get harder as time goes on. You know, especially, by the way, when it's a type of tragedy where people surround you in the initial phases with, with comfort. And then it gets really, really, really lonely. You know, I remember reading in, uh, in, in one of the uh, grief, grief books, uh, or, or listening to someone, I forgot, but something that really stuck with me uh, was the idea that when you lose someone that you love, the hardest time is actually usually not in the very beginning, but it's after everyone else has forgot about it, but you haven't forgot about it. So everyone else has kind of moved on with life. Other people have lost loved ones at that point. Communities moved on. Extended families moved on. But you're sort of... You're, you're really starting to feel the void. The void becomes even more permanent in your life. That's natural. That's natural. Uh, and so for the person of Ihsan, by the way, the person of excellence who wants to comfort and console, reach out to people after some time has passed when most people have forgotten and say, hey, I was just thinking about you and thinking about this. Want to check in if you need anything. I'm here for you. 
That's number one. But when you're going through these types of tragedies, these types of hardships, uh, every single time you feel the pain of it, that can be another sadma. That's another sadma, it's another strike. And respond the way that you responded the first time. Remind yourself, Alhamdulillah, inna lillahi wa inna raji'un. And keep on trying to make progress to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And don't feel like you're unnatural or that you are a sinful being because it starts to hurt more as time goes on. That just means that you process things differently. And we all process things very differently. Sure. Okay. Okay. Was the microphone? Oh, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. So for the past two days, alhamdulillah, you guys had a theme of du'a going on. I just have a question about adab du'a or the etiquette of du'a. Are there certain things to keep in mind when making du'a, kind of like adab tilawat al-Qur'an, and is thana ala Allah, which many people do before du'a, a part of du'a and etiquette of du'a? You want to be talking about the second, the second part of the question is? Thana ala Allah. Like yeah. So if you, if, if you, uh, so actually the, the night khatiras that I've been doing in Tarawih were all around the etiquette of du'a. So um, we went through asma, sifat, calling upon Allah with his, his, his asma, his names, and then his sifat, and then his attributes, and then af'alihi, his doings, and then alhamd wa thana, wa talab, um, al-inkisar, Sheikh Yasser also spoke about al-inkisar, al-iftiqar, to be broken in, in, in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So enrich your du'a with the mention of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, reading the Qur'an can also be a form of preceding the du'a, that's fine because it's a good deed within the du'a and a means of connecting you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, reading du'as from the Qur'an is blessed. So from the etiquettes of du'a is to enhance your du'a with the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and particularly connect the names of Allah and the attributes to Allah to the request that you're making of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so that's something that is open. Uh, as the ulama say, the matter of du'a is wasir. It's very, very broad, very expansive. And, and sometimes people get so caught up in trying to say things exactly as it's written, as opposed to saying things with their heart being most present. Mm -hmm. And that's the greater priority in du'a, is letting some of these things sometimes flow natural as well. So using the springboards the Prophet ﷺ gave us with some of these foundational du'as that we then, you know, Leap into our own personal du'as and see where your heart and your tongue take you at that point. Allah. If I may add one more thing, actually, from the etiquette of the du'a as well, too, is to start with the thana, the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before you start with your request. Mm -hmm. It's a very impolite when you raise your hand and say, Ya Rabb, give me this. Just say, Alhamdulillah, Allahumma laka alhamd, you're my Lord. This, admit your, you know, your weakness, your need, and this and that. It's just like, you know, grabbing the door and just go through the door and enter the someone's house before even saying, Assalamu alaikum, can I come in? So the etiquette of dua should be with praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You raise your hand, you praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like Shaykh has mentioned, mention the beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, saying hamd and, and shukr of Allah azza wa jal. And then slowly and gradually, then you start making your request of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you, give you this, give you that, and so on. Wallahu ta'ala. Naam. Go ahead. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Jazakallah khair for these late night uh, heart softeners. Just going back to the story uh, of Prophet Ayyub alayhi salam, where in conversation with his wife, um, he said that he will wait another 80 years before asking for ease in their situation. Um, and what you mentioned, uh, that when the guest of hardship and trial visits, we must endure it. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran that we will be tested. So connecting this back to last night about multi-dimensional du'as, and focusing on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the actual ask itself. So when we are tested with trials outside, outside of exercising patience, should we then ask for ease and comfort in our du'as? And then what does a multi-dimensional du'a look like in that situation? Excellent question. So, Zakallah khair. So actually when I teach the course on Ayyub alayhi salam, I go into all of the different uh, scholarly interpretations of that, that incident with him. And there are a few of them, and that's why I was even talking to um, Sheikh Hatim about it and asking his, his opinion on it, right? And um, he mentioned, you know, one of the things that the scholars mentioned that he really wanted to, to uh, make the most of the men's of the station. Uh, one of the reasons for that, that the scholars mentioned with Ayyub alayhi salam, is that the nature of the tests of the prophets were all of one nature, which was to raise their, their rank. Whereas the nature of the tests that come to the rest of us could be the raising of the rank, could be the purification from a sin, could be a reminder 
for us because we're starting to become heedless and forgetful. So the nature of test for the rest of us is of a more diverse nature than the nature of test to the prophets. When Allah tests the prophets, He's testing them and raising their rank. And so Ayyub alayhi salam understood that. And so the prophets understood that. This was not a form of punishment. Rather, it was a form of raising the martaba, the rank that we were talking about last night as well. So that's one interpretation. Uh, the other uh, thing that some of the scholars mentioned is that we do find some examples. Um, uh, in fact, Imran and Hussain radiallahu ta'ala anhu in particular, who was in a similar situation and uh, in, in the... Uh, you know, I, I did an episode about Imran ibn Hussein in, in the um, uh, Angels season two. Uh, I talk about him because it was very interesting because he mentioned that uh, he felt such a closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the angels, uh, there was a miracle that was given to him which was that the angels gave him salam, uh, a miracle for him, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and it was said to him, you know, why don't you ask Allah to remove this bala? And he gave a similar answer to Ayyub alayhi So some of the scholars, they said from that, that a person does not necessarily have, they don't have to ask Allah to remove the hardship. That's one, one interpretation. Some of the scholars also made a point to say that Ayyub alayhi was in istighfar, in seeking forgiveness. And the Prophet ﷺ said that whoever seeks forgiveness, من لزم istighfar, whoever is consistent in seeking the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah will remove their hardship. And so he was actually implying the removal of hardship, even if he wasn't directly saying remove this hardship or remove that hardship, which lines up with the dua of Yunus alayhi salam, la ilaha la anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al which is a dua of tawbah. It's really a form of seeking forgiveness, and it removed the hardship from him. And the Prophet ﷺ said that whoever makes du'a with that, the du'a of Yunus salam, then the hardship will be removed as well. So that's one thing that we learn uh, from it also. I'm going through all the interpretations. I should probably just get to the point. The point of this is that there are multiple ways to look at this. But the guidance we take from the Prophet wasallam is that ask Allah for the removal of the hardship, but make sure that the priority is the realization of the reward that Allah reward you and that Allah remove the hardship. And so for the believer, those two things are not in contradiction. If I may just add one more thing actually, is it even, uh, um, is it possible even if it's recommended for a believer to avert hardship? Like if you know that hardship is gonna come your way, is it permissible for you, even recommended for you to try to avert that hardship by getting out of it if, if it's way? The answer is yes, absolutely. You shouldn't be welcoming any hardships really, but if it comes, then in this case you endure it. Uh, and, the, and the example of this happens in the story of Abu Ubaidah, Amr ibn Jarrah radiallahu anhu wa and Amr ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. When Abu Ubaidah was the commander of the Muslim uh, uh, population armies in, in the Sham, he invited Amr ibn Khattab to come somewhere to, to meet him in, in a certain place. So Amr ibn Khattab on his way, he heard that there is a plague raving in that area, raging in that area. So he asked Abu Ubaidah, meet me outside so I can actually get, so stay away from, from the situation, from, from the plague over there. So Abu Ubaidah tells Umar ibn Khattab, what, are you going to run away from Allah's Qadr? So the answer of Umar was brilliant. He goes, yeah, I'm running away from one Qadr of Allah to the other Qadr of Allah. Which means the Qadr of Allah you're asking me to go into is the Qadr of, 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 uh, of uh, sickness and illness and even danger, right? I'm asking you to come to the Qadr of safety. So yeah, uh, just because we say that, look, when there's a calamity, you have to endure it, you have to do this, you have to show patience and so on. It doesn't mean to open arms for these calamities. Yes, we say it's like a guest, but if it happens, you have to deal with it. Wallahu a'lam. Now. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So my question was, um, when you go through hardships, just like time after time and back to back, and you're just being like torn apart by these, but you still live in a good surrounding, like alhamdulillah, you have a roof under your head, and alhamdulillah, all your family members are alive and with you, but life just keeps throwing these punches at you. Is it considered being ungrateful or complaining when after a certain period of time, you start to get emotional about it? Or does it mean you have better iman because Allah keeps testing you? Or is Allah punishing you for something with these hardships and tests? What do you think? Yours. Um, it's not a sign of low iman to feel the pain of the test at all. Uh, it's, 
a sign of high iman to channel the test into supplication and closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, we're deeply complex beings. Some of us are more emotionally intense than others, honestly. And uh, there's also a sense of, and I guess the human psychology element of this too, there's a Shaykh, uh, Shaykh Salman al-Uda, Hafidhullah Ta'ala, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala free him from his, from his tribulation uh, and all of the scholars that are unjustly imprisoned. I mean, and I remember someone that was working with him, like he did, they were saying he doesn't cry much anymore. And he mentioned something along the lines of like his tears dried up with the amount of just pain he was going through, right? You're enduring one trial after the other. It's sort of like it's harder to get emotional for him because at some point there's a numbness that can overtake the person. And I've heard that from other people that have been through severe trial that there's a numbness that can overtake a person. That numbness is not a numbness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala necessarily, but it could be sort of a, almost a numbness to the pain or a defense mechanism on the inside of you, right? That you psychologically react in a certain way um, you know, as, as a means of, of protecting yourself when something happens. And some people, you know, they talk about ice in the veins, right? Like some people in, the, in, the, in, some, in, in a very intense moment, um, they, can, they can do inkar, as their intimate mentioned, like they can deny their hearts, they can, they can completely forbid the emotional element from overtaking them, and then they just fall apart like the next day, you know? Um, so it's like delayed grief, you know, like in the beginning, like deal with it, and very like almost stoic, and then next thing you know, when they're alone, it's like, whoa, it hits them really hard, right? And that's when they're able to sort of sit with themselves and they allow themselves to go through their emotions. So people are gonna react in different ways at different times. How do you channel it? How do you channel it? So long as you channel it to dua, so long as you channel it to an increase in good deeds, then ta'ala, you're in a good place. Uh, and so long as you don't assign any assumptions as to why it's happening that are uh, along the, the lines of su Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, and expecting bad from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or assigning some sort of deficiency to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then bid the night ta'ala, it's all uh, praiseworthy and there's nothing to worry about. You shouldn't feel like Allah is punching you. You should feel like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is raising you based upon your response bid the night ta'ala. No. Um, by the way, just I want to just add one more thing here. Sometimes all these trials and tests are just relative, really. Meaning what you consider to be a test, for other people it's a blessing. I mean, I remember one time we went to a refugee camp and we were helping uh, some of the families. There was some, uh, some, some stuff that we brought to them, food and things and so on. But subhanAllah, the, the man, dignified families, they insisted that we come into their, uh, their tiny little space that they have actually as a home for themselves. He insists, you guys have to come in, we have to, you know, you are our guests, we have to get you something. And uh, subhanAllah, we got in there, in that, into that room, and they served us tea. And even when we look at the, you know, the, the, the tray itself, it's bent, the cups are, every, one, every cup is, looks different, and nothing really, I need to say, uh, presentable in a way that to make perfection about it. And you look around in the house, in the room that we were in, there were just maybe a couple of cushions we were just sitting on and maybe a few utensils here and there in that room as everything was in that room basically. Everything, they, their possessions were all there. And as we were done, alhamdulillah, he was entertaining us with his conversation, talking, just the spirit is unbelievable, really. It puts you to shame. And then as we were leaving, we say, uh, is there anything we can help you with? He goes, alhamdulillah, we have everything. And I swear, I was looking at the guys with me and just we're looking around, what the, what is he talking about? What is he really talking about? There is absolutely nothing in that room, but all their possession, was in that same room that we were sitting in. And for him, he just like, Alhamdulillah, we have everything. Now, that level of really, of, of understanding of Iman in that moment, the endurance we're talking about, puts us really to shame when it comes to dealing with hardships as we see them in our life. But again, like I said, the, the pain and the, and, the, and, the, and the trials are relative trials. For some, what you consider to be a trial you're going through, they will tell you, you get to kill me. Alhamdulillah, I mean, that's a blessing. So may Allah make it easy for us, Rabbul Alameen. Amen. Question, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi So, Shaykh, you mentioned earlier how um, Imam Jawzi gave the analogy of um, how to deal with a trial should be the same way, how you should deal with uh, the guests. Mm -hmm. And then Shaykh Omar later on has talked about how when someone gets trial, um, he doesn't necessarily see the light at the end of the tunnel until later on in life, or whatever the case is. And then, so the question here is, Allah in the past couple of nights, y'all have mentioned that Allah has tested Imam Ibn Jawzi with his own son. 
And so the question is, um, how did <coughs> Imam Joji deal with that test considering the fact that his son wasn't necessarily a momentarily thing, more than it was an ending thing until either one of them dies or whatever the case is? Barakallahu feekum. Now, if I, I'm going to comment on the story of his, of his son, actually. If you remember from our chapter last night, when we talked about the delay of the dua. So Ibn, Ibn al-Jawzi, rahimahullah, he presented in that chapter, he says, and I've been through something, he said. I've been through my own personal trials. That's what he said, right? And I don't think he, he wanted to make it explicit, but I believe he was referring to his trial with his son, which I mentioned uh, briefly in the introduction of the book. Uh, and the author, rahimahullah ta'ala, his son was one of the students, at least on the path of seeking knowledge. And then at some point, subhanAllah, he just switched path completely. And you can imagine the trial, subhanAllah, and he just lost it to the extent that he used to steal his father's books and then sell them in the market to get cash and money. Finally, his father made dua against him, really. Now, we don't know what the circumstances were back then, Allahu alam. But as you can see, Humans have their own limitations as well too. The humans have limitation of their own. And it's interesting because people might say, wait a second, I mean, isn't he a scholar, alim, people repent and cry when he speaks? What about his son? Why doesn't his son, you know, speak and, and cry? It's a phenomenon actually, it's across, you know, the line of, of the students of knowledge and ulama and teachers and imams and shuyukh and so on, all these things. You always hear about great shuyukh and ulama and imams, but rarely you will find their kids follow in their footsteps. And, and uh, the ulama, they spoke about this phenomenon from before, and they said, look, subhanAllah, in many cases, the reason why the kids don't follow suit in the path of their parents, because when they were kids, the people give them special treatment that they felt becoming entitled to it as they grow older, without the need for them to work for it, like their, their parents did before. Like for a alim to be recognized, he had to go through a long, long actual journey to be recognized. His kids, they get easy pass because of their father. But when they were kids, people give them that special treatment. But when they become adults, now what happens? The, 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 same, the same people who give them special treatment when they're kids, what do they do right now? They demand from them now a different return, different yield from, from that treatment. And these kids didn't probably maybe put the effort to do it uh, in that way. So that's a trial of Ibn Jawzi rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi. How did he endure it to, to, what, to what extent? Allah Ta'ala. No. Well, my kids are here, Shahiyya. Oh, yeah, my right. daughter's here, so. You gotta oh, tell her. We'll you talk about, tell her she I'm not talking about be, Sheikh Omar, brother. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you gotta tell me. That. This is not about her. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, it's, SubhanAllah, I mean, Shaykh um, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith, قال, يعجب ربك من شاب ليست له صبوة. If a youth or a child grows through uh, life from being a child, to going through adulthood without uh, a rebellion, that's a great blessing. Can you imagine that? Being from childhood to adulthood without rebellion, that's a great blessing. Guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which means it's expected in the youthful age that they will rebel. Now, to close the story of Ibn, Ibn Jawzi rahimahullah, there were some reports, I'm not sure about the reliability of these reports, that later on in his life, this young man actually he recalibrated and came back again to uh, a better position in life. Allahu alam, I can't confirm or deny these reports. Yeah. No. I'll just share on that, by the way, subhanAllah, on that note. Imam Malik, rahimahullah, sometimes it's the same parent and then, you know, one goes this way, the other goes this way. True. And it, it, it was baffling. You know, Imam Malik, rahimahullah, had a daughter that was just stunningly immersed in, in his knowledge to the point that she memorized his muwatta and uh, she would check his students. So when his students would be reciting, and if they made a mistake, she'd, she'd knock on the door. Like she was listening to the students recite the muwatta of her father, the collection of hadith. That, by the way, Imam al-Shafi rahimullah said, the most authentic book in the world after the Qur'an. This is before the compilation of Sahih al-Bukhari was muwatta. Most of the hadith of the muwatta made themselves, made their way into, into Sahih al-Bukhari. But you know, imagine his daughter was so dedicated to that ilm knocks on the door when someone makes a mistake when they're reading the hadith and she memorized the muwatta. Must be intimidating. Sure. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> so it's, it's, and then he had another son that just didn't, didn't pan out that way. So I think what it shows you, I mean, to connect it to the broader topic is that this deen and this guidance needs to be wanted. You've got to want it. At some point you have to make that decision, especially for those that grew up with religious parents 
forget about scholars or not just religious parents, practicing parents, at some point, you've got to want it yourself. And if you don't want it yourself, then it's not going to land in the heart. Yeah. And so that's why this is an individual track. And Allah Azza wa does not wrong any one of us. So just because they're, they're, their parents are not religious doesn't mean that they're going to eventually follow them to this path. Absolutely. A reminder to all of us, subhanAllah. I mean, uh, we have the example of Nuh alayhi salam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him one of the top five messengers of the, in the Quran, Ulul Azmi in Rusul. But then he made his wife and his son the top examples of disbelief, Allah Musta'an. There is no guarantee, like Shaykh Masih, until you want it yourself. Wallah Yes. Question from the brother. No, from the sister side, actually. Okay. <clears throat> uh, what is your advice on Muslims struggling with their faith due to the hardships they see going on around the world, like in Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, etc.? And how do you explain to a non believer that it could be a test from Allah? Uh, just for the sake of time, I did a khutbah a few years ago when, when the first. Uh, when Halab, I remember very specifically, there was a massacre in Halab, in Aleppo, Syria. And so if you actually go to the Yaqeen channel, Why Do the Innocent Suffer? Um, I, I broke down quite a bit of that, just, just for the sake of time. I will answer you, but just to go through that, inshallah as well. Um, Sheikh Mohammed al-Shanawi actually has a, a paper as well on Yaqeen, Why Do Innocent People Suffer? Which we had, alhamdulillah, someone embraced Islam actually very recently after reading that paper. Um, how do I explain it to a non-believer? You actually can't. <laughs> because if they don't believe, they're not going to get it. Tr tr tribulation in this world doesn't make sense without something that is outside of this world, both in the sense of control and in the sense of consequence. Tribulation will not make sense in this world without the existence of a power outside of it and a world outside of it. Mm -hmm. Because if you have to justify everything within it, you're going to fail. You're going to keep on running into a wall. And what you could do as a result of that is you could, you could just say, you know what, forget about all of it, none of it makes sense, and I'm going to just close my eyes and just deal with the consequences if there is something after this, and if there is a God outside of this. That's not very smart. <laughs> it's not very smart. Or you could try to explore the existence of that power outside of this realm, and the, limit the, the unlimited outside of this lim these limitations that we are familiar with. Uh, for the believer that struggles, uh, suffers. Um, it's important to understand that empathy is a good thing. To care about your ummah, to care about people being oppressed, that's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember we talked about hardships that are disguised as blessings? That pain is part of what makes your heart beat and softens it, keeps it connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, connected to your ummah, which is a sign of faith because to not care about your ummah is a sign of a lack of faith. The, the, the point is, is that you go back, and just as we're talking about individual trials and hardships, you say, look at the past, look at the current, and then focus on the future. Sometimes, subhanAllah, what Shaykh Yasser just mentioned, I've experienced this myself. You talk to people in Gaza, and they're not having the faith crisis that you're having on their behalf. <laughs> Like it's, it's interesting, you know, you talk to, I've been in the Syrian, ref, I've been in Syria, I've been to the Syrian refugee camps multiple times. They're not having the faith crisis that you're having on their behalf. Srebrenica, ya Allah, ya Allah, ya Allah. I mean, gruesome, brutal, Bosnia. The, the mothers of Srebrenica, uh, Srebrenica who, who, I mean, witnessed horrors, unspeakable horrors, and have the most beautiful smiles. And like, they're content. Not that it doesn't hurt, like crazy, but they're content. So it's important for us to take a step back and say, look, they understand their jaza. We too should understand that Allah Azza wa Jal will distribute his jaza, his reward accordingly. We also understand that in past times, more righteous people were tested with more difficult circumstances. Generations that came before, right? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned Iman is in Yemen. Al Imanu Yamani. And subhanAllah, you see what's happening over there. The Prophet mentioned about Asham, that the, the angels of Allah spread their wings over Asham. Right? And you see what's happening. While the angels spread their wings, there are bombs falling upon them as well. Because there's something in the hearts of the believers 
that cannot be taken away from bombs or drones or tragedy. And that is a kingdom in the heart of the believer. And so let them you know, focus on their reward and you focus on removing the bombs, but don't question the wings of the angels. You focus on lifting the hardship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you for that, inshallah ta'ala. But you have to believe in something outside of this. Otherwise, if you are so focused, if the removal of limitation and the removal of punishment is the cause by which you believe and don't believe, then you're always going to be in turmoil because the world is never consistent in that regard. If there isn't a problem here, there's a problem there. And the uh, last thing I'll say, my 30 seconds. Uh, social media has made it impossible to imagine a time where you're not going to be hyper exposed to tragedy. It's just, it's a fact now, subhanAllah, that look, I mean, there was a time when if you lived in uh, and you look at the turn of the 20th century in particular, the Islamic movements that came out of that, they tended to be very uh, geographically focused. And so revivalists in this part of the world, when they, tend to, when they tended to think about ummah, ummah meant something to them, which was really mainly what they were exposed to. So if you were living in India, if you were living in Egypt, if you were living in uh, you know, uh, the, the Gulf, the Arabian Gulf, if you were living in Africa, you're really, when you say ummah, you're thinking about the Muslims you've been exposed to, naturally. Now it's like, like, it's constant exposure, right? You have to take all of that exposure and funnel it through a singular lens. Otherwise, you won't catch up. And that lens is the lens of certainty in Allah's decree. Allah. I believe actually that time is up right now, inshallah, yeah. to our questions. Jazakumullah khair. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put barakah in your life, inshallah, rabbil alameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect you all and keep you safe Amen. in this dunya and in the akhirah. Amen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.